today we're talking about why kids hate school. And this isn't the definitive uh, the reason why every child hates school, but these are some themes that I've come up with and that I want to discuss with you and hear from you about why your children hate school. And for those of you who are educators, what you're observing in kids who don't like school. So now that we're sort of full full swing into the school year, um, uh, what I'm noticing is that uh, kids are starting to sort of fall back into uh, some patterns of disliking school that emerged last year or maybe the year before. Um, and for you know, our divergent kids, those kids with ADHD, maybe with a coexisting condition like autism or a learning disability or twice exceptionality or you know, who, who qualify for twice exceptionality or maybe have anxiety or depression or other mental health issues. These are kids who work really hard to hold it together during the course of the academic day. Um, and various teaching styles that they encounter may not actually make sense for their brains. Uh, long periods of time sitting at desks, complicated peer interactions, and constant demands on their very real executive functioning challenges combine to make school sometimes the hardest area of functioning for these alternative learners. When they arrive home, desperately needing time to recover and process what's happened or simply zone out, they, they face homework, after school activities, chores, or even a part-time job. It may all seem like too much. Tempers rise, meltdowns occur, and the dislike of school and this cycle just continues. So what we're gonna talk about today is how you can offer effective caring support uh, to shift the mindset for your kids with ADHD to embracing parts of school. They don't have to embrace the, all of it, but to find things that they can really latch on to and enjoy. So I have some comments already. I'd like to check those out. So let's see. Hi, Melissa from Philly. That's my hometown. Hi, Kelly. You're a solo practitioner of 30 years specializing in neurodivergent kids. You have two kids with ADHD, ODD, anxiety, and one with dyslexia. Thanks for sharing. Chaka, can I share to help my community partners? Of course, please share. We love sharing. Um, that's me as an adult. Life is, an, uh, that's me as an adult. Life is hard and they lack social skills. So some of the challenges we're going to talk about for kids or for our kiddos are also things that we may experience as adults. So it's all fair game today in the conversation. Nancy, you have a high school student and he indicates that he's bored. Jenny, you have an ADHD and ODD kiddo too. Hi, hi, Luena. Hi from Sydney. Nice to see you. So um, let's talk a little bit about the ODD ADHD connection first because um, a couple people have brought it up. So about 40% of kids with ADHD have a coexisting condition of what's called oppositional defiant disorder, ODD. Now, uh, ODD, I believe, is a relationship problem. Um, often the kids themselves have the label, like that they're, they are the problem, but really um, they may have some irascibility. But part of the issue that's going on for them is that they can't, um, they don't, they can't really communicate their needs or their thoughts in ways that are effective and that they feel heard and, um, and, and seen. So we want to be able to, um, to, uh, to be able to um, help them uh, with that uh, process. And one of the ways we're gonna help them with that process is by um, you know, offering them support that they need, and that includes uh, treatment. Now, the best and most effective treatment for oppositional defiant disorder actually is you know, parent training, quote unquote, or family work because it, it, it's this communication problem that these kids are having with adults in their lives that, that lead to this kind of oppositional behavior. Medication can also be useful, and research has shown that the combination of medication with um, you know, cognitive behaviorally oriented family therapy can you know, reduce the symptoms and the patterns of ODD within two years. Okay, so... Um, Let's keep going. So let's let's sort of start with what are these problems that um, kids have with, with with school and why they hate it. 
So the first problem is that uh, is related to unrealistic goals for neurodivergent students. Um, and this would be unrealistic goals for the uh, for adults that we might set for ourselves as well. So since school uses all executive functioning skills throughout the day, and in that handout that Annie posted, I'm going to post it one more time here for you. Um, I'm, I, I'm, I give you an example of executive functioning skills and how they show up in kids. Um, what happens is that having ADHD means naturally that you have severe executive functioning challenges that are that are they're greater in number than we see in kids who don't have ADHD or adults who don't have ADHD. So we all have executive functioning challenges and strengths. I've been very open here with you that one of my challenges has been emotional control, um, emotional regulation, that I come from a long line of really strong-willed and opinionated, intense people. It's not so easy for me. I also struggle sometimes with time management. I think I can do more in a given amount of time than I actually can, which of course increases my anxiety. But a lot of my other executive functioning skills like initiation, planning and prioritizing, organizing, those are very well intact. For people with ADHD and for kids with ADHD, it's often the reverse. They have one or two areas where they're strong and a number of areas that are challenging. So when your child is at school and they're using all of their executive functioning skills, initiation, working memory, um, you know, focus, um, sustained attention, goal setting, uh, goal persistence and setting goals, also, you know, impulse control, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they, when they come home, they're tired because it's already exhausting for them to manage these executive functioning challenges on their own. But to do it hour after hour at school is really depleting. So um, they've been asked uh, repeatedly throughout the day to, um, to uh, adapt to and to perform at neurotypical levels, um, which may or may not work for their um, unique brains. And, and for many of these kids, they could have unusual strengths in some areas, but not in others. And because they have those strengths, these kids particularly, who are often twice exceptional, they're expected to perform in all areas at the level of their strongest interests and abilities, even though they cannot. Some students struggle because they have undiagnosed learning disabilities or, you know, perhaps a, a, a co-occurring mood uh, or anxiety disorder. Um, the, the standards that are placed on uh, these kids often put unnecessary stress on them and contribute to negative attitudes they have about being at school, about their capacity for learning, and result in lower self-esteem, okay? Um, there are a few comments and someone asked a question, so, okay. Yes, so there are a few comments here that I wanna share. Uh, Chaka says, I have a son who is diagnosed with ADHD and emotional disorder with compulsive behavior that struggles with comprehending whatever he reads or hears. Yeah, and that's something that you're doing all day long in school. Janet, verbal articulation skill difficulty would exacerbate ODD. Absolutely, because you have the feeling, but you can't attach the word to the feeling, right? You just have the feeling. Um, hi, Emily from the Bay Area, my second home. Um, you have two sons with ADHD. One of them is on the spectrum and the seven-year-old hates school, sadly. Hi, Dorothy. Uh, thanks for sharing. Okay. So, um, the other thing that happens in terms of these unrealistic goals is that um, people will see kids with ADHD who are bright, um, and particularly uh, those kids who are twice exceptional, who you know are gifted in some areas, maybe in in in, in verbal uh, verbal verbally, or maybe in you know not not more nonverbal areas, and they expect that that giftedness will actually. Um, sort of, you know, kind of spill over into their ability in areas that where they actually struggle. 
um, and that would include working memory or processing speed. This is why it's very important when you have a child who is an alternative learner to have a very good psychoeducational assessment because you want to know the map of how your kid's brain works. These maps also determine services, but more importantly, they help you understand, oh, here's the strength. Oh, here's the challenge. That's why we're seeing these behaviors, these attitudes. Sometimes alternative learners feel very misunderstood by their teachers and by their parents, and they harbor a lot of frustration and resentment that nobody really seems to get them, and they're mad at people for not understanding them. Like what it makes it so hard that you can't understand me? What is wrong with me that you can't understand me? So let's look at our first solution. So first solution, as I just said, is to make sure your child has been fully evaluated for learning challenges and other you know, mental health issues. We call these psychoeducational evaluations. Um, you, if you live in the United States and often in other countries, you can request this evaluation through the school. You can also pay privately to have someone do the evaluation. It's up to you. Sometimes insurance will cover it in the US, sometimes it won't. Um, we want to make sure that mandated services are in place for your kids if they qualify. Next, in conversation with your student or the teachers or the guidance counselors, we want to create two sets of expectations. Why are we applying one set of expectations across the board to alternative learners? The first set of expectations should be related to an interest or a talent or a strength, something that the child or teen enjoys and does well. We want to ask them, what goal would you like to put out for yourself regarding this thing that you're good at and you like to do? What do the adults think the youngster can handle? Make an agreement about this, write it down, and check in weekly about it. Weekly check-ins are a very important time to be able to assess how things are going, how things are working, so that we don't have to have periods of intense acting out because the child feels like no one's listening or paying attention. Excuse me. <coughs> the second set of expectations should be related to an area that is more challenging, something that your student either doesn't enjoy or struggles with. What goals would be realistic to set here? For example, if your teen loves and math and is taking an advanced math class, what are their hopes for the performance on this subject? By the same you know, token, if they're also dyslexic and English is tough, what would be appropriate goals for that class? Things don't have to be the same. They don't have to be equal. But the process of talking about these issues and making doable plans works best when there is consistency. Now, as those, those of you who are familiar my, with my work know my five C's, self-control, compassion, collaboration, consistency, and celebration. Consistency is not about perfection. Consistency is about steadiness. Consistency is about efforting, the, the integrative process of using your body and your mind and your emotions to work together on a task or a project um, towards, um, you know, obviously completion, but maybe not completion, maybe just actually being engaged is, a, is could be a better goal for your kids. So um, talking about these issues, and even with a seven-year-old, you can have this kind of conversation and you can set up some sort of consistent plan when we're gonna check in. How, we're gonna know, how are we gonna know if it's working? The goal is to develop a sense of progress to encourage efforting and nurture strengths while shoring up challenges. So let me look at some of the comments here about problem one. Let's see. Uh, Jocelyn, if a child is diagnosed with depression, anxiety, and ADHD, does it make sense to start with ADHD medication treatment as it could be the root cause to other challenges? So, you know, there's kind of a chicken or an egg conversation about this. Um, 
I think that, um, you know, this encourages this, you know, means that you have to have a really good diagnostician to sort of tease out what the different elements are that are going on. A lot of people would say, yes, we want to help with the ADHD first and then deal with the anxiety. Um, some parents prefer to deal with the anxiety first. We know that untreated anxiety leads to depression, but also untreated ADHD contributes to anxiety and depression. So, you know, it, it's real, this is a really kind of particular um, answer to who your child is. TR, I have one 15 year old with anxiety and ADHD. I'm currently sitting in therapy with my seven year old who fights when it's time to go to school. I have anxiety, obviously. Thank you, TR, for sharing. Um, so you, you know, anxiety, you know, runs in families. There is a genetic predisposition for it. It's not necessarily inherited, um, like ADHD is, but you know, people are are can be prone to it in families. Um, and you know, when your seven-year-old is fighting about going to school, it's because they actually are unhappy in the school. They don't feel like school is working for them. So we want to try to help figure out a way that school could work for them, that there's something happening in school that's worth looking forward to. Nancy, I think I answered that. Cheryl, my seven-year-old was really ahead in reading and writing. She is fixated on natural science and has a vast amount of general knowledge and facts in her brain. Now she has to sit still and focus. She can't do it and gets very annoyed very quick. Sure, of course, because the way that she's having to learn doesn't work with her brain. So what kinds of ways could we incorporate movement or standing or um, or, you know, the, what I love the Pomodoro method. You work for you sit for a few minutes, then you move, then you sit for a few minutes, then you move. We need to break it up for her um, because she's very bright, clearly. And she has these facts and she wants to apply them. But the way that um, she's being asked to participate isn't working for her. And this would be something that you would maybe put in a 504 plan if um, if your child does not qualify for an IEP. Susie, my eight year old, eight, my girl eight is eight with ADHD. I suspect dyslexic battling with school. She's brilliant. I'm learning all I can with my own late diagnosis. Well, good for you, Susie, because your own late diagnosis will inform the ways that you assist your daughter. Um, she's battling with school because she knows she's smart. She gets information, but she can't package it or access it or um, you know execute it, produce it in ways that would be helpful for her and would make sense given her level of intelligence. So we need to assist her in 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 get in learning tools. To, to, to do that. She has to have tools, techniques, and supports um, to, be able to, uh, to be able to, you know, apply her intelligence. So maybe she has trouble reading, but maybe she likes listening to things um, and following along. Um, maybe she has trouble writing, but she's great at talking out her ideas. We want to make some adaptations early on now while she's eight, so she feels confident and confident in her learning and can move forward. Caitlin, <coughs> excuse me. I have custody of my nephew. He was an opioid addicted baby due to severe drug use while pregnant. There's no data out there, but they keep labels of ADD and ODD. It's so much more. I think EBD might be possible. Any insight? So a lot of times what happens is they will give kids a label of something that they can see and identify and treat. Because for, for sometimes for kids, behavior is behavior. And even though your child may have these other issues, um, treating the ADD and the ODD and even including medication might help on a synaptic level to make connections that have... Um, that were, were delayed because of the addiction. Uh, Shannon, I don't know about a neuropsychological evaluation until two years ago. Professionals just kept saying he had ADD, ADHD and DMDD. Okay, so, you know, that's terrible, Shannon, and I'm glad that you know about it now. Let's get, I hope, I hope you've gotten him one and that's been helpful. Thank you, Mandy, for sharing. Dorothy, not many, especially here in Cyprus, talk about diet and how important it is to balance the hormones of the body. Yes, 
It is very important, Dorothy. We, particularly for women, and particularly for women as we mature and go through the change, the uh, our hormones really affect our ability to concentrate and to um, to, uh, to to attend to things, uh, to stay focused and manage our distraction. Um, this is something that uh, that absolutely should be discussed with more people. Uh, okay, let's see. Um, Kristen, eight-year-old, trouble with trouble reading and writing, no one wants to diagnose. Not quite sure he has ADHD, but not typical presentation, so everyone keeps saying he's lazy. Okay, Kristen, I wanna tell you, this makes me crazy. Um, he's not lazy. Lazy goes out the window. He's struggling and um, they don't want to diagnose anything or have they given him an evaluation because we need to understand what's happening and how his brain is processing. Because if we understand how his brain is processing, whether or not we give him a label, we can give him interventions. School avoidance. A lot of kids don't like going to school. We'll talk about that in a minute. They don't like going to school for all the reasons that we're discussing. So why would you want to go to something that's so unpleasant and you don't enjoy? Hi, Anne. You have ADD and learning disabilities and hearing impaired. I have a son with ADD and learning dis ADHD, excuse me, and learning disabilities. I have managed to get two degrees and written a book about my experiences. Good for you, Anne. I was told I would never be able to go to college or university by a government-sponsored agency to get people off disability benefits. I'm so sorry to hear that, and I'm so glad you persevered. Bravo. Shannon, now I know. He's AU. I see. He just had one completed. I just had one completed for my youngest. The public Montessori magnet denied an FIE, only a 504, and punitive punishment. So one thing that you want to think about is if your kid's in the school that suits them best. Because if your child is protesting and you're working with the school and the school is not working with you, you have to start to ask about your rights as a parent of a child who has um, uh, special learning uh, considerations. Um, and if you don't know what those rights are, then I encourage you to try to find an educational advocate or start uh, learning about the law. The five C's, self-control, compassion, collaboration, consistency, and celebration. Thanks for asking. Hey, Nathan, ADHD parent, uh, late diagnosis, children exhib exhibiting similar difficulties, however, not necessarily with the same strengths, I see, that you used. My personal experience with not being understood means I try to relate with my children, but they often shut down and won't talk about their difficulties. I don't know how to handle that as talking through things is my MO and I don't know what to do when people won't talk things through. What a great um, father you are for trying to talk things through. Um, and kids shut down because they might be overwhelmed or overstimulated. They may also not be able to process all the things that you're saying. So I think um, you know what I would try to do is shorten your sharing about your experience and ask open-ended questions that begin with how, what, where, um, or when, rather than why. Okay, let's go on to the second problem about why kids hate school. Inconsistent motivation and focus. Dr. Thomas Brown, uh, for whom I have much great esteem, um, in his book, ADHD and Asperger's Syndrome and Smart Kids and Adults, talks about the central mystery of ADHD as fluctuating motivation and attention that varies based on a variety of interests. It's very confusing for kids, teens, and adults with ADHD and those who live, teach, or work with them about why someone can concentrate on something like playing the guitar for hours or you know, being absorbed in reading a book uh, or playing a computer game, but not be able to focus on a 20 minute ass assignment for science. So motivation is based on a strong personal interest or the belief usually that something bad will happen imminently. Um, and that seems to get people going, but not always. Jules, age 15, says, I feel like if I'm interested in a subject, I'm really good at it. But if I'm not, it's not as good. If I'm not interested in it, I'm spacing out. 
I'm just not paying as much attention. It really depends what mood I'm in. Do any of you see this in your kids? Because what we're, what Jules is saying, he's aware of how interest affects his concentration, but if it's boring and there is, or he's not in the right mood, he just can't bring himself to do it. So what's the solution for this? We want to nurture motivation based on identifying interests and also relying on both intrinsic and extrinsic incentives. You know, extrinsic motivation refers to an outside responsibility or reward that depends on achieving a goal. You pay for your train ticket in advance, so you have a seat. You turn in your history paper on time, so you don't get a poor grade. Intrinsic motivation means striving toward a goal for personal satisfaction or accomplishment. You decide to ride your bike for 10 minutes, for 10 miles instead of five, or you want to make the next level on your computer game. Intrinsic motivation is what drives us naturally because we're engaged and happy in what we're doing. But when there's no clear immediate satisfaction from a task, it takes folks with ADHD longer to do anything. They would prefer to avoid it, um, to do something they enjoy first. They just don't want to go to that dreaded activity. And so we have to change this pattern by putting the have to's before the want to's. This means we need to set up incentives that matter to kids, those extrinsic um, motivators, rewards, to get them to tackle the unpleasant stuff. And that helps them over time set that up for themselves internally. Oh, I've, I, I finished dinner. I'm going to cl clear my plate and wash my dishes before I sit down to watch my show because I know that after I watch my show, I'm gonna to be too tired and tomorrow the plates will be disgusting and I won't be able to clean them. I've learned that pattern over time. So we wanna break undesirable tasks into small pieces. So there's a sense of accomplishment as you're moving along. Let's go back to some comments. Lorena. My hello, my ADHD 11 year old. I have all A pluses in other classes, but not in PE. He does not like physical activity. I already did a new evaluation in the Kennedy Krieger. My son bites his nails almost all the time. <coughs> so, what you're saying is that he's doing really well, except in physical um, in PE because he doesn't like physical activity. Can you work with the school to come up with some alternatives for PE? Um, you know, could he have an exception? Could he engage in PE that he enjoys? What would that look like instead of maybe what's what everyone is being asked to do? Is there any flexibility here? Also, many kids with ADHD will bite their nails. Uh, there's a couple reasons for that. One is sensory stimulation. The other is um, anxiety um, and a sense of, you know, um, uh, um, you know, having energy and worry that needs to go somewhere. And the, the third one is uh, self, uh, so it's a, a form of self-stimulation um, in a way. Chaka, why is it police and others who don't have training to understand a person like my son? And how can I get him help or services? And can someone email me some information? Uh, Chaka, I would encourage you to search the Attitude website at length. I would also encourage you to please um, follow me on Facebook and sign up for my um, my newsletters. Um, this would be a great way to, uh, you know, tr learn more yourself and then share with others. Okay, school expects 95% attendance and he doesn't want to go. So, um, I, you know, I think that for kids who have trouble with, it, um, with, a, with it going to school and attending school, usually districts have a social worker who has an expertise in this kind of area. And, um, and if not, then I would encourage you to talk to the social worker or the guidance counselor or whatever at the school and the principal to see how you could make going to school something special. Like, is there, could, could, could your child have some, you know, help out in the, in the office for a little bit before school, some kind of privileges, things that seem like privileges, um, but that, you know, raise his engagement, something that he's interested in too. Heather, what things would help in school for anxiety? My son chews his fingers until they bleed. Um, very sorry to hear this. Heather, uh, fidgets. 
Uh, he should be given some fidgets. A fidget is not a toy. A fidget, it takes over the zzz part of the brain. A toy is something that distracts you. Um, so we want him to be doing something else with his fingers other than chewing them. Tracy, my nine-year-old grandson has problems with anger. If he can't do something easily, like win a game on his Xbox, he gets mad and throws things and screams and cries. And if his younger brother says something, he goes after him. He was diagnosed with ADHD and ODD, but I think it's more or wrongly diagnosed. You know, a lot of kids with ADHD struggle with anger. Um, that's not our the focus of our topic today. I'm, I will be talking about that on my Facebook live, on my webinar, excuse me, on Wednesday, the 19th of October here on Attitude. Um, this is exactly what we'll be talking about. So I hope you'll join me. Um, it's important to remember that the ADHD brain matures more slowly in terms of how it manages intense emotions and impulses. So your, your grandson may be nine chronologically, but in terms of his ability to self-regulate, he's probably more like a six-year-old. Shannon, for 16 years, one son fought school. Now I know why. Sensory issues related to clothes and the transition, lack of sleep. It's, it's amazing how you can sort of, when you can see what the causes are, even in retrospect, it can help you, um, you know, make a difference. Claire, while my son was in French school, he really hated school and was really struggling because he couldn't understand French. And the school refused any accommodations because they only offered support for math and English in a French school. Claire, that's terrible. Anne, forgot to mention I live in Canada. I admire everyone who has come on here today. Thank you, Anne. Melissa, I believe my seven-year-old is doing a significant amount of masking at school. Thank you so much for bringing this topic up. I, I'm really grateful. She complains she hates school because she is a slave, not enough free time and social challenges. She has an IEP and takes breaks and gets more empathetic support. Uh, they say she seems pretty happy but reports differently at home. Does she just need to vent and have me validate? You know, I think that might be the case. Um, sometimes, um, again, you know, I said this earlier, kids hold it together at school really well. And how they're holding it together at school is who they're becoming. And then they come home and they kind of let that that mask or they, they, they let their guard down and we see who they've been. Um, they need a place um, to kind of let it out. Uh, I had one client who would hold it together at school and come home and really literally start rolling around on the floor. He was about eight actually. And he said, I need my flippy floppy time. And so we decided that it would be family flippy floppy time. And during that 10 minutes, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, five to 10 minutes when everybody walked in the door, people stretched, they could dance, they could listen to music. He could roll around on the floor. Everybody just needed to discharge what they were carrying, even adults. Okay, Melissa, my son has ADHD combined type, now developed anxiety on an IEP. Every morning is a struggle just for him to get going and ready. I'm an educational diagnostician and I'm really struggling. Thanks, Melissa, for sharing. Um, and it must be especially hard because you, because of your own work. Um, I'm not clear if he got an anxiety when he was on his IE because of the IEP or if the anxiety developed um, just naturally over time. Um, is there something about the services that he's receiving on the IEP that are making him feel bad about himself? Is he receiving some counseling around that? How can we normalize the services that he's receiving so he's not feeling bad about himself? Kelly. As a high school LS a teacher, it's very difficult for me to stay motivated when my students are frustrated because they're being made to learn stuff that doesn't matter to them all day long. I wish there were more options to tailor their education to their interests to some extent. That just doesn't happen, unfortunately. It really doesn't. And what I wish that there was more of was, you know, experiential learning. You know, a lot of schools, particularly independent schools, have the resources to have maker spaces and, and to have more, um, you know, full body, what I call full body learning. And, and um, many public schools are more, or, you know, um, just don't have those resources. And so um, kids are suffering. Shannon, uh, my, 
my son says he is an impatient teacher that yells. Well, this is a really interesting um, point, Shannon. We might want to have a conversation with you and the teacher um, and your son or you and the teacher and the principal and talk about, you know, what he is experiencing as impatient and yelling versus what they are actually doing, because they could be very different things. Yes, the teacher could be impatient and yelling and um, feel like that the teacher needs more support. And the teacher may, be, have, may have a volume or a tone of voice that your son experiences as yelling, but isn't yelling. Okay, let's go to the third problem because I wanna get through everything today. So what's the third problem with why kids hate school? Uh, na trouble navigating the social world. So many neurodivergent kids struggle with making and keeping friends. They may feel awkward at the lunch table, at recess, or speaking up in class. They may miss verbal or visual cues and, and misread body language. Often they may not notice that other kids seem to display an ease with each other that they um, often they notice um, th that they don't possess. So school is an environment where not only the academics, cognitive thinking and production are on full display, but the social world is on full display. It's the, it's the, it's the, um, it's the, it's the bowl, it's the crucible for launching friendships and changing relationships and comparisons to others and a place where kids experience bullying. So managing social dynamics, along with all of the academic challenges, can overwhelm the already taxed executive functioning skills of kid, children and teens with ADHD. Many of these kids feel ashamed that they can't um, be like everyone else. Um, they might hide what's going on, like the mom who said her daughter is, might be masking. Um, at school, and they also may lack the language to discuss their true feelings. So what's the solution for this? Well, extreme self-consciousness, <coughs> uncertainty about the definition of a friend, or difficulty with the give and take of relationships can lead to exclusion or isolation. These outside the box thinkers compare themselves to others and often find themselves lacking. But the creative unique ways that alternative learners see the world can also result in leadership opportunities and peer respect. Um, a lot of kids with ADHD are, are seen in a positive light. They're funny, they're kind of quirky, they're in, independent individuals, um, and the kids, look, the kids think are cool. Um, they may not see this themselves, however. So building social school skills, of course, is critical for developing the self-confidence and you know, increase comfort kids need with interpersonal interactions. So help your child or teen with ADHD by brainstorming and practicing conversational tools at home, at the dinner table. There was a really excellent article in the New York Times Magazine over the weekend about the importance of family dinner. And um, <clears throat> there was something um, uh, several years, many years ago called the dinner, par the dinner project I think that's what it was called, where people did research about the benefits of family dinner. It doesn't have to be every day, but if it can be on certain days a week where you sit down as a family, you turn off the devices, you have a conversation, maybe you play a little game, um, that, can be, that can really teach some you know, important skills, how to make eye contact, how to listen, how to respond appropriately. Um, we want to help our kids create a few stock responses to common questions and ha have an exit strategy when they feel uncomfortable. I taught one of my tween clients to say, that's a good question. Can I get back to you when she didn't know what to stay, say because she would just turn and walk away and then people would be mad at her. Um, now she has a tool and that actually worked. People weren't mad and she was able to give herself that time that she needed to circle back and give a response. Even going over phrases to say in the hallway, such as, hey, nice to see you, or what's up, can help kids feel more comfortable. <laughs> Learning how to make a little bit of contact with people is, 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 is the way to get the ball rolling. As parents, we also have to determine the right amount of involvement of, in the social lives of our children. We're very sensitive 
to what's going on with them. And of course, we're reactive and protective of them when they're struggling. So when there's an issue, listen first, instead of giving advice, work with them to come up with some ideas that they think they could try, ask them if they'd like to hear a suggestion or two from you, and then practice what you, what you talk about. Okay, let's go back to some comments. There are many. Tana, my son is five and has ADHD, has sensory issues, only goes to school two hours a day, cannot focus more than three minutes at a time. He has adopted and has a bad background like bipolar and cipherina. Do you think he should be on pills? He's five years old. Um, Tanya, Tana, I don't give medical advice, uh, particularly around medication um, because I'm not a physician and also because I don't know your child. Um, but, you know, I think for a five-year-old who has this background and um, has sensory issues, you know, he's really more like a, t a th two or three-year-old. So maybe two hours a day is all he could really handle. Um, Heather, kids that have trouble with executive functions are always labeled lazy, but it's way deeper than the lazy label. Amen. And that is just such a terrible word. We just want to throw it out of the vocabulary. Is it the school that can diagnose ADHD or do I have to go privately? So in the United States, when you have a psychoeducational evaluation, schools cannot diagnose ADHD because it's considered a health um, condition. They can say it looks like ADHD and then you take the report to your primary care provider who then can give you a diagnosis. A private um, evaluator who is a licensed uh, you know, neuropsychologist or clinical psychologist can give you a diagnosis. A therapist can give you a diagnosis. Um, Shannon, yes, how do I help my SPED students when gen ed teachers struggle to interact and teach neurodiverse students? So I, I think the thing that we, we want to do is we want to really educate uh, teachers that neurodiversity is an umbrella. And under this umbrella, we have neurotypical kids and neurodivergent kids. And we're all part of the same human race, just like ethnic diversity or um, gender diversity or um, diversity of sexual preference and religion, et cetera, et cetera. So um, what we want to do is we want to help teachers understand that different brains learn in different ways. And the ways that the neurodivergent students learn um, requires um, more concrete steps and laying out things that are directly related to building executive functioning skills. This also helps neurotypical students because these are skills that everybody needs to mature into um, a, you know, a connected autonomous adult. Sarah, I just took my son to the dentist. The dentist says that his ADHD could come from a lack of sleep. I'm frustrated the dentist said that in front of my son because my son has had a hard time accepting his challenges and diagnosis. My son was tested at school and diagnosed with ADHD and a processing disorder. What should I say to the dentist at the next visit? Okay, Sarah, even though I said I'm you not, not um, you know, maybe not don't give advice when someone tells you their problem, I'm gonna give you some advice. If it were me, I would call the dentist and I would ask to speak to the dentist myself. And I would basically say to the dentist exactly what you just said to me. It's not okay that you said this in front of my son. You're not an ADHD expert, you're a dentist. And in the future, I do not want you to discuss his ADHD with him without my permission. Furthermore, I would like you to write him a note to let him know that it was wasn't it, you know, you were wrong or you made a mistake or whatever to undo the damage that you just did. Because the damage that you did, now I have to undo. And I don't have the authority since I'm not a dentist. I have a lot of feelings about this. <laughs> I'm sure you can all see this. It enrages me. Um, so yes, I'm encouraging you to stand up to that dentist. Maybe even find another one. <clears throat> Um, let's see, my son likes going to school. Great, Becky. Um, he struggles with reading and writing. He has an IEP. What can we do to help the two areas? He's 13 in middle school. So if he struggles with reading and writing and he has an IEP and he's getting services, I would want to know, you know, what they're doing in the services that are that's helping and how you can support those interventions at home. 
because you might have expectations of how much reading and writing he should be able to do on his own, what that would look like. And, and really what we want to do is partner with the school and what they're doing. So he's getting the same message at, sc at school that he's getting from you at home in terms of expectations and production. Emily, is stimulants, ADD meds have worked wonders for my 14 year old. Thanks for sharing that. Um, okay, let's see. Nathan, thank you. With 20 years of sales experience and the hyper focus on the psychology of conversation, I understand the value of open ended questions and use that often, but shutdown is shut down. This is true. And, and, and your kids are shutting down um, uh, because they may not want to talk to you when you want to talk to them, first of all. Uh, they may be more interested in talking to you while they're engaging in another subject. And secondly, you might want to, you know, create something where you have a high and a low of the day that you talk about at dinner. Everyone does that. Um, I remember I did this with my daughter when she was 13 and she was like, didn't want to have anything to do with me. And I said, okay, so um, can you tell me a high and a low of your day? And she said, um, Uh, she said, I, I forget what she said. She said something and, and I and um, and and I said, well, that's only one thing. And she said, no, that was the high and the low. <clears throat> so we, you know, incentivizing conversing means you're still pushing your agenda onto them. So what we want to do is set up a, a situation where sharing something about your day is part of what's expected in the family. So you may not get as much information as you want, but you're still getting something. Um, Susie, I'm going to turn that question about supplements over to Annie. There's a lot of stuff in uh, Attitude about this. Um, let's see. Christina, my eighth grader goes to private Catholic school. They don't do IEPs or 504s. They put in place something they call an educational support plan that has accommodations for my daughter if she needs them. But I found out at the parent teacher conference that her teacher wasn't even aware of her educational support plan. What rights or laws are there for ADHD students in private schools? Um, <clears throat> this is a great this is a great question. I am actually not completely sure of this answer, and I like to be honest when, with you. Um, I don't know what the rights or laws are for um, for kids who have a special education needs at private schools. Um, but I know that they're different. It's it's not okay that her teacher wasn't even aware of her uh, ESP, and um, and I think it would be worthwhile to call a team meeting with all her teachers to go over the components of that plan with them to make sure they know. Okay, let's go to the fourth um, problem. The fourth problem is fixed or fixed mindsets. Um, you know, kids with ADHD and, and friends are often a concrete thinkers uh, with fixed mindsets that as a result of experiencing persistent negative feedback about themselves. Maybe they struggle with verbal impulse control or recall or emotional regulation. Um, <clears throat> many kids aren't aware that they're doing something that's offensive until they receive a negative message. So this increases their worry about messing up in the future. Uh, fixed mindsets lead students to give up on things quickly, sometimes before they've even tried. They don't see the possibility of a different outcome. And of course, that affects academics, athletics, extracurricular activities, and social relationships. So what can you do differently? Nurture a growth mindset. How are we going to do that? By noticing and validating what's working for your child or teen. Your kids need help with counterbalancing the negative things they tell themselves and hear from others because the ratio should be three positives for every negative. And for most of the kids with ADHD, what I hear from them and their parents is it's one positive for 10, 20, 30, 40, sometimes even 50 negatives each day when they think about what other people say to them and what they say to themselves. So this growth mindset refers to the belief that you can change and grow from your mistakes and that lessons, um, rather than something we should avoid or be afraid of, are a natural part of living. This mindset is crucial 
for alternative learners because they need to learn. They need to realize that they can regroup after trying something that doesn't work instead of blaming or shaming themselves. When we try something, we risk failure. When we avoid something, we ensure it. As Daryl, age 12, says, hopefully this works. If not, I'm going to have to find a new way to do it, to be brave. It's hard sometimes, but there's always a way to pick yourself up. This is a demonstration of resilience that goes hand in hand with the growth mindset. So um, <clears throat> we have a few more minutes left. Um, let me get to some. Uh, um, okay, Ta, uh, Team Min Ho, Team Min Vo, my 17 son who has ADHD quit his favorite sport, freestyle skiing, following quite a severe concussion in 2021. Since then, he has spent most of his time playing games, rarely moves except walking 10 minutes to school, eats poorly, and mostly connects with online friends. I'm concerned and would like to know how to help him have a better and healthier lifestyle and spend less time video gaming and more time energy studying. Um, question, has he recovered from his concussion? Um, and are there other sports that would give him that rush of adrenaline that are not freestyle skiing? Um, it seems to me that you know video games give a big dopamine hit um, in a way that freestyle skiing might. So we wanna to try to figure out what else could, could do that. Might it be running? Um, you know, being part of a track team, maybe playing ultimate Frisbee, what else would be a sport that would be perhaps a little bit safer, but still give that, um, that, you know, adrenaline uh, to get him going. Kimberly, should I look for a dyslexic school specifically? There are none near me. I'm about an hour away from specialized schools. Um, you know, there's some value in kids going to a specialized school for a year or two to really um, <clears throat> improve their challenge and um, get the support they need. And then you can consider main, you know, sort of quote unquote mainstreaming them back to um, a, a public school or they can stay at the school, but it's worth considering. I know it's an hour away and that seems like a big haul, um, but at least visit and see what you might get there then you're not getting where you are. Cheryl, mine can't put her finger on what's made school so hard most days. She lies about other children saying what they, they've done things when they haven't. I've some I've someone's hit her and fixated on one person when nothing's happened. She's looking for a reason why her day was so hard. So so one thing that you we might want to do with a young child who's struggling like this is to be able to say to them, you know, <clears throat> school's hard for people who, you know, have um, brains like ours um, or, you know, who who struggle with attention and focus and it's not any particular thing it's just the process of like shining the spotlight of focus on on onto what you're doing is exhausting and and it's hard to do it's harder for you than it is for other kids on the other hand you're really good at x and y which is harder for some other kids so we all have our strengths and our challenges and we want to couch it that way our adhd or hates long car rides to or from school or anyone else. She will make loud noises and not stop. She will say extreme things and pick fights by insulting the driver. Mm, that's not okay. She makes it so hard to drive to and from school. This happens many times in the carpool uh, per week. We live in a rural area. What can we do to help her? Um, would it be helpful for her to have some headphones and listen to music or a podcast or books on tape? Um, can you can you stop midway through the drive to just have a stretch um, or get, you know, a drink somewhere, particularly after school and a little snack? Um, can you link, um, you know, being um, uh, making that making different choices on the way to school to getting that stop on the way from school? These are some suggestions that I have. Yes, picky eating and ADHD go together. That again has to do with sensory sensitivity um, and um, just you know really focusing on sort of hyper focusing on things that it, you know have the right texture or taste and not being able to um, talk about the others. You're welcome, Sarah. Um, let's see. Um, 
Unfortunately, in Cyprus, they're trying to have separate schools for kids with ADHD, ADD. I don't know how we can help them by separating them from society. Why don't they see it's wrong? I don't know. That's really sad. And it makes kids feel terrible about themselves. Like they're not, they're in like the weird special school, not in the regular school. Um, <clears throat> my girl worries about getting into trouble. Another girl is picking up on it and she struggles to see that some kids are simply poking her. Yeah, it's going to be hard for her um, to basically um, have a thick enough skin to not be poked at. And so I think, um, again, what we want to try to do is understand these scenar scenarios, talk to teachers and faculty at the school, and give her some tools of things to say or do in those moments, specific things to say or do. Yes, this video will be uh, available later. Only public schools are required. That's what I thought. Annie, thank you. Um, that was my feeling, yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, Big Life Journal is a great resource for growth mindset with free weekly downloads. Yes, Melissa. Thumbs up. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I'm sorry to hear about this mindset. Uh, can you come up with a school plan? I see you're giving some advice to um, someone else. Thank you. Um, my seven-year-old with ADHD struggles with sitting at family dinner. We try all the time, and it always ends up frustrating because he won't stay at the table and disrupts the family. Could he stand <clears throat> and eat? How long is a long enough for him? Could we start with five minutes and have him standing um, and consider that successful and then do that for a while and then maybe go to six minutes? Uh, we want to we want to we want to get success. The, the main thing is success. So um, to have him sit with the family for a, you know, a, a very small period of time uh, and then to be excused and then to do it again. So we're continuing to practice this routine. Well, um, we have definitely gone over. There are many, many more comments. I think this requires a follow-up session. Um, so many of you sh shared so many important issues. Um, Heather says, I work at my son's school. I'm his number one advocate and heavily involved with everything. He hates school. Last year was super rough, but this year is better. That's good. And it's a struggle every single day to leave the house for school. How do I find the root of his I hate school? You know, sometimes, and this goes back to Nathan, your kids will tell you the root of why they hate school, or they'll give you examples of bad things that happened during the course of their day, bad. Um, but they may not actually like open up the book and say, oh, here's why I hate school. It's often a combination of things. And that's what I tried to present today in my, in my little talk, is that it's, there are a number of things that come together that make school unpleasant for kids. Um, and so, um, you know, we want to try to work on one issue at a time. So if we can identify one part of school that isn't working, what can we do about that one thing? And then stick with making that thing more tolerable, even you know, acceptable. Then we can work on something else. Part of why kids hate schools is it's this ball of all this stuff and all of these executive functioning tasks and requirements that come together. And they can't tease them apart because they don't have the mature brain, they don't have the matured brain yet to do it. So we want to assist them by doing, helping them with this or finding people who can assist them. Sometimes, particularly with teens, they don't want to hear what you have to say as their parents. This is why we want to get someone else involved. Maybe it's a coach. Maybe it's a counselor. Um, maybe it's a mentor. Um, so we want to offer them um, other perspectives, but still stick with changing one thing at a time. Well, thank you very, very much for joining me. Again, um, please uh, go to the, get your downloadable about executive functioning skills since they're such a key part of school and why, where kids struggle. And maybe share that with your kids and try to identify an area of executive functioning that you, where you struggle and something that they struggle. And could you support each other in a parallel process? Because certainly we can all work on improving some aspect of ourselves and it normalizes that process for our kids who are very, very busy telling themselves 
that something is uniquely wrong with them instead of we all have strengths and challenges. Thank you. Have a wonderful weekend. And I will see you next week when we're going to talk about focus, um, particularly in um, assisting adults with focus. But join us if you have a child who struggles with focus, because it will certainly be relevant to you as well. Also, please join me on Wednesday for my webinar, um, which is on um, managing anger and uh, creating um, uh, converse conversations uh, to help us diffuse difficult situations. Annie, if you put a link up there for that, that would be great. Um, <clears throat> I'm having a little blank on the title in this moment, which is so embarrassing. Um, uh, but um, uh, it, 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 I, I guarantee it will, you'll get some good tips on how to manage uh, conflict in your family. Have a great day and I'll see you next week. There you go, when um, emotional triggers and outbursts, how the um, scripts for your flashpoints. Thank you. All right, bye everybody.